Chapter Nine of The Two Gun Men by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Tom Penn. Would you be a character? The sun was still a shimmering white blur in the great arc of sky when Ferguson rode around the corner of the cabin in bare flat, halted his pony, and sat quietly in the saddle before the door. His rapid eye had already swept the horse corral, the sheds, and the stable. If the horseman that he had seen riding along the ridge had been Radford, he would not arrive for quite a little while. Meanwhile, he would learn from Miss Radford what direction the young man had taken on leaving the cabin. Ferguson was beginning to take an interest in this game. At the outset, he had come prepared to carry out his contract. In his code of ethics, it was not a crime to shoot a rustler. Experience had taught him that justice was to be secured only through drastic action. In the criminal category of the West, the rustler took a place beside the horse thief and the man who shot from behind. But before taking any action, Ferguson must be convinced of the guilt of the man he was hunting, and nothing had yet occurred that would lead him to suspect Radford. He did not speculate on what course he would take, should circumstances prove Radford to be the thief? Would the fact that he was Mary Radford's brother affect his decision? He preferred to answer that question when the time came, if it ever came. One thing was certain. He was not shooting anyone, unless the provocation was great. His voice was purposely loud when he called, Whoa, mustard, to his pony but his eyes were not purposely bright and expectant as they tried to penetrate the semi-darkness of the interior of the cabin for a glimpse of Miss Radford. He heard a movement presently, and she was at the door, looking at him, her hands folded in her apron, her eyes wide with unmistakable pleasure. "'Why, I never expected to see you again!' she exclaimed. She came out and stood near the edge of the porch, making a determined attempt to subdue the flutter of excitement that was revealed in a pair of very bright eyes and a tinge of deep color in her cheeks. "'Then I reckon you thought I had died or, or stampeded out of this country,' he answered, grinning. "'I told you I'd be coming back here.' But the first surprise was over, and she very properly retired to the shelter of a demurely polite reserve. "'So you did,' she made reply. You told me you were coming over to see my brother, but he's not here now. Had he been less wise, he would have reminded her that it had been she who had told him that he might come to see her brother. But to reply thus would have discomfited her, and perhaps have brought a sharp reply. He had no doubt that some of the other two diamond men had made similar mistakes, but not he. He smiled broadly. Maybe I did he said. Sometimes I'm mighty careless in handling the truth. Maybe I thought then that I'd come over to see your brother. But we have different thoughts at different times. You say your brother ain't here now? He left early this morning to go down the river, she informed him. He said he would be back before sundown. His eyes narrowed perceptibly. Down the river meant that Radford's trail led in the general direction of the spot where he had seen the fleeing horseman and the dead two-diamond cow with her orphaned calf. Yet this proved nothing. Radford might easily have been miles away when the deed had been done. For the present, there was nothing he could do except to wait until Radford returned to form whatever conclusions he might from the young man's appearance when he should find a two-diamond man at the cabin but anxiety to see the brother was not the only reason that would keep him waiting. He removed his hat and sat, regarding it with a speculative eye. Miss Radford smiled knowingly. I expect I have been scarcely polite, she said. Won't you get off your horse? Why, yes, he responded, obeying promptly. I expect Mustard's been doing a lot of wondering why I didn't get off before. If he had meant to imply that her invitation had been tardy, he had hit the mark fairly, for Miss Radford nibbled her lips with suppressed mirth. The underplay of meaning was not the only subtleness of the speech, for the tone in which it had been uttered was rich in interrogation, 
as though its author, while realizing the pony's dimness of perception, half believed the animal had noticed Miss Radford's lapse of hospitality. "'I'm thinking you're laughing at me again, ma'am,' he said as he came to the edge of the porch and stood looking up at her, grinning. "'Do you think I'm laughing?' she questioned, again biting her lips to keep them from twitching. "'No, I wouldn't say you was laughing with your lips.' laughing regular but there's a heap of it inside of you trying to get out don't you ever laugh inwardly she questioned he laughed frankly i expect there's times when i do but you haven't lately well no i reckon not not even when you thought your horse might have noticed i had neglected to invite you off did i think that he questioned of course you did well now he drawled. And so you took that much interest in what I was thinking. I reckon people who write must know a lot. Her face expressed absolute surprise. Why, who told you that I wrote? she questioned. Nobody told me, ma'am. I just heard it. I heard a man tell another man that you had threatened to make him a character in a book he was writing. Her face was suddenly convulsed. I imagine I know who you mean, she said. A young cowboy from the Two Diamond used to annoy me quite a little until one day I discouraged him. His smile grew broad at this answer, but he grew serious instantly. I don't think there's much to write about in this country, ma'am, he said. You don't? Why, I believe you're trying to discourage me. I reckon you won't listen to me, ma'am, if you want to write. I've heard that anyone who writes is a special kind of person, and they just can't help writing, any more than I can help coming over here to see your brother. You see, they like it a heap. They both laughed, she because of the clever way in which he had turned the conversation to his advantage, he through sheer delight. But she did purpose to allow him to dwell on the point he had raised, so she adroitly took up the thread where he had broken off to apply his similitude. Some of that is true, she returned, giving him a look on her own account, especially about a writer loving his work. But I don't think one needs to be a special kind of person. One must be merely a keen observer. He shook his head doubtfully. I see everything that goes on around me, he returned. Most of the time I can tell pretty near what sort of a man is by looking at his face and watching the way he moves. But I reckon I'd never make a writer. Times when I look at this country, at a nice sunset, for instance, or think what a big place this country is, I feel like saying something about it. Something inside of me seems kind of breathless-like. Kind of scared me. But I couldn't write about it. She had felt it, too, and more than once had sat down with her pencil to transcribe her thoughts. She thought that it was not exactly fear, but an overpowering realization of her own atomity, a sort of cringing of the soul away from the utter vastness of the world, a growing consciousness of the unlimited bigness of things, and insight of the infinite power of God the yearning of the soul for the understandings of the mysteries of life and existence. She could sympathize with him, for she knew exactly how he had felt. She turned and looked toward the distant mountains behind which the sun was just then swimming, a great ball of shimmering gold, which threw off an effulgent expanse of yellow light that was slowly turning into saffron and violet as it met the shadows below the hills. Who ever saw such colors? she asked suddenly, her face transfixed with sheer delight. It's certainly pretty, ma'am. She clapped her hands. It is magnificent, she declared enthusiastically. She came closer to him and stretched an arm toward the mountains. Look at that saffron shade which is just now blending with the streak of pearl striking the cleft between those hills. See the violet tinge that has come into that sea of orange and the purple haze touching the snow caps of the mountains? And now the flaming red, the deep yellow, the slate blue. 
and now that gauzy veil of lilac, rose and amethyst, fading and dulling as the darker shadows rise from the valleys. Her flashing eyes sought Ferguson's. Twilight had suddenly come. It is the most beautiful country in the world, she said positively. He was regarding her with gravely humorous eyes. It certainly is pretty, ma'am, he returned. But you can't make a whole book out of one sunset. Her eyes flashed. No, she returned. Nor can I make a whole book out of only one character. But I am going to try and draw a word picture of the West by writing of the things that I see. And I am going to try and have some real characters in it. I shall try to have them talk and act naturally. She smiled suddenly and looked at him with a significant expression. And the hero will not be an Easterner, to swagger through the pages of the book, scaring people into submission through the force of his compelling personality. He will be a cowboy who will do things after the manner of the country, a real unaffected carefree puncher. Have you got your eye on such a man? he asked assuring himself that he knew of no man who would fill the requirements she had named. "'I don't mind telling you that I have,' she returned, looking straight at him. It suddenly burst upon him. His face crimsoned. He felt like bolting. But he managed to grin, though she could see that the grin was forced. "'It's getting late, ma'am,' he said as he turned toward his pony. "'I reckon I'll be getting back to the Two Diamond.' She laughed mockingly as he settled into the saddle. There was a clatter of hoofs from around the corner of the cabin. Wait, she commanded. Man is coming. But there was a rush of wind that ruffled her apron, a clatter, and she could hear Mustard's hoofs pounding over the matted mesquite that carpeted the clearing. Ferguson had fled. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Disappearance of the Orphan. During the night, Ferguson had dreamed dreams. A girl with fluffy brown hair and mocking eyes had been the center of many mental pictures that had haunted him. He had seen her seated before him, rapidly plying a pencil. Once he imagined he had peered over her shoulder. He had seen a sketch of a puncher upon which she appeared to be working, representing a man who looked very like himself. He could remember that he had been much surprised. Did writers draw the pictures that appeared in their books? This puncher was sitting in a chair. One foot was bandaged. As he watched over the girl's shoulder, he saw the deft pencil forming the outlines of another figure, a girl. As this sketch developed, he saw that it was to represent Miss Radford herself. It was a clever pencil that the girl wielded, for the scene was strikingly real. He even caught subtle glances from her eyes. But as he looked, the scene changed, and the girl stood at the edge of the porch, her eyes mocking him and then to his surprise she spoke i am going to put you into a book she said then he knew why she had tolerated him he had grown hot and embarrassed you ain't going to put me into any book ma'am he had said you ain't giving me a square deal i wouldn't love no girl that would put me into a book he had seen a sudden scorn in her eyes love she said her lips curling. Do you really believe that I would allow a puncher to make love to me? And then the scene had changed again, and he was shooting the head off a rattler. I don't want you to love me, he had declared to it. And then, while the snake writhed, he saw another head growing upon it, and a face. It was the face of Leviatt, and there was mockery in this face also. While he looked, it spoke. You'll nurse him so he won't die, it had said. When he awakened, his blood was surging with a riotous anger. The dream was bothering him now, as he rode away from the ranch house toward the gully where he had found the dead two-diamond cow. 
he had not reported the finding of the dead cow, intending to return the next morning to look the ground over and to fetch the doggy back to the home ranch. It would be time enough then to make a report of the occurrence to Stafford. It was mid-morning when he finally reached the gully and rode down into it. He found the dead cow still there. He dismounted to drive away some crows that had gathered around the body. Then he noticed that the calf had disappeared. It had strayed, perhaps. A calf could not be depended upon to remain very long beside its dead mother, though he had known cases where they had. But if it had strayed, it could not be very far away. He remounted his pony and loped down the gully, reaching the ridge presently and riding along this, searching the surrounding country with keen glances. He could see no signs of the calf. He came to a shelf rock presently, beside which grew a tangled gnarl of scrub oak brush. Something lay in the soft sand, and he dismounted quickly and picked up a leather tobacco pouch. He examined this carefully. There were no marks on it to tell who might be the owner. A man that loses his tobacco in this country is mighty careless, he observed, smiling. Or in pretty much of a hurry. He went close to the thicket, looking down at it, searching the sand with interest. Presently he made out the impression of a foot in a soft spot, and, looking further, saw two furrows that might have been made by a man kneeling. He knelt in the furrows himself, and with one hand parted the brush. He smiled grimly as, peering into the gully, he saw the dead two-diamond cow on the opposite side. He stepped abruptly away from the thicket and looked about him. A few yards back there was a deep depression in the ridge, fringed with a growth of nondescript weed. He approached this and peered into it. Quite recently, a horse had been there. He could plainly see the hoof prints where the animal had pawed impatiently. He returned to the thicket, convinced. Someone was here yesterday when I was down there looking at that cow, he decided. They was watching me. That man I seen riding the other ridge was with the one who was here. Now, why didn't this man slope too? He stood erect, looking about him. Then he smiled. Why, it's awful plain, he said. The man who was on this ridge was watching. He heard my gun go off when I shot that snake. I reckon he figured that if he tried to ride away on this ridge, whoever done the shooting would see him, and so he didn't go. He stayed right here and watched me when I rode up. He smiled. There ain't no use looking for that doggy. The man that stayed here has run him off. There was nothing left for Ferguson to do. He mounted and rode slowly along the ridge, examining the tobacco pouch, and then suddenly he discovered something that brought an interested light to his eyes. Beneath the greasy dirt on the leather he could make out the faint outlines of two letters. Time had almost obliterated these but by moistening his fingers and rubbing the dirt from the leather, he was able to trace them. They had been burned in, probably branded with a miniature iron. D.L., he spelled. He wrote on again, his lips straightening into serious lines. He mentally cataloged the names he had heard since coming to the Two Diamond. None answered for the initials D.L., it was evident that the pouch could belong to no one but Dave Leviatt. In that case, what had Leviatt been doing on the ridge? Why, he had been watching the rustler, of course. In that case, the man must be known to him. But what had become of the doggy? What would have been Leviatt's duty after the departure of the rustlers? Obviously, to drive the calf to the herd and report the occurrence to the manager. Leviatt may have driven the calf to the herd, but assuredly he had not reported the occurrence to the manager, for he had not been into the ranch house. Why not? Ferguson pondered long over this, while his pony traveled the river trail toward the ranch house. Finally he smiled. Of course, if the man on the ridge had been Leviatt, he must have been there still when Ferguson came up 
or he would not have been there to drive the two-diamond calf to the herd after Ferguson had departed. In that case, he must have seen Ferguson, and must have been waiting for the latter to make the report to the manager. But what motive would he have in all this? Here was more mystery. Ferguson might have gone on indefinitely arranging motives, but none of them would have brought him near the truth. He could, however, be sure of three things. Leviatt had seen the rustler and must know him. He had seen Ferguson and knew that he knew that a rustler had been in the gully before him, and for some mysterious reason he had not reported to the manager. But Ferguson had one advantage that pleased him. He even drew a grim smile to his lips as he rode on his way. Leviatt may have seen him near the dead two-diamond cow, but he certainly was not aware that Ferguson knew he himself had been there during the time that the rustler had been at work. Practically, of course, this knowledge would avail Ferguson little. Yet it was a good thing to know, for Leviatt must have some reason for secrecy. And if anything developed later, Ferguson would know exactly where the range boss stood in the matter. Determined to investigate as far as possible, he rode down the river for a few miles, finally reaching a broad plain where the cattle were feeding. Some cowboys were scattered over this plain, and before riding very far, Ferguson came upon Rope. The latter spurred close to him, grinning. I'm right glad to see you, said the puncher. You've been keeping yourself pretty scarce. Scared of another run-in with Leviatt? Plum scared, returned Ferguson. I reckon that man'll make me nervous, give him time. You don't say, grinned Rope. I wasn't noticing that you was worrying about him. I'm right flustered, returned Ferguson. Where's he now? Gone down the creek with Tucson. Ferguson smoothed Mustard's mane. Leviatt been with you right along? He went up the creek yesterday, returned Rope, looking quickly at the stray man. Went alone, I reckon. With Tucson. Rope was trying to conceal his interest in these questions. But apparently Ferguson's interest was only casual. He turned a quizzical eye upon Rope. You and Tucson getting along? He questioned. Me and him's of the same mind about one thing, returned Rope. Well, now. Ferguson's drawl was pregnant with humor. You surprise me. And so you and him have agreed. I reckon you ain't willing to tell me what you've agreed about. I'm sure telling, grinned Rope. Me and him's each dead certain that the other's a low-down horse thief. The eyes of the two men met fairly. Both smiled. And I reckon you and Tucson are loving one another about as well as me and Leviatt, observed Ferguson. There ain't a terrible lot of difference, agreed Rope. And so Tucson's liking you a heap drawled Ferguson absently. He gravely contemplated the puncher. I expect you was a long way off yesterday when Leviatt and Tucson come in from up the creek, he asked. Not a terrible ways off, returned Rope. I happen to have this in, and they pass right close to me. They clean forgot to speak. Well, now, said Ferguson, that was sure careless of them. But I reckon they was busy at something when they passed. In that case, they wouldn't have time to speak. I've heard tell some folks can't do more than one thing at a time. Rope laughed. They was putting in a heap of their time trying to make me believe they didn't see me, he returned. Otherwise, they wasn't doing anything. Shucks, declared Ferguson heavily. I reckon them men wouldn't go out of their way to drive a poor little doggie in off the range. They're that hard-hearted. Correct, agreed Rope. You ain't missing them none there. Ferguson smiled, urging his pony about. I'm figuring on getting back to the Two Diamond, he said. He rode a few feet and then halted, looking back over his shoulder. You ain't given Tucson no chance to say you drawed first, he warned. 
Rope laughed grimly. If there's any shooting going on, he replied, Tucson ain't going to say nothing after it's over. Well, so long, said Ferguson, urging his pony forward. He heard Rope's answer, and then rode on, deeply concerned over his discovery. Leviatt and Tucson had ridden upriver the day before. They had returned empty-handed, and so another link had been added to the chain of mystery. Where was the doggy? End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. A touch of local color. A few months before her first meeting with Ferguson, Mary Radford had come west with the avowed purpose of absorbing enough local color for a western novel. Friends in the east had encouraged her. An uncle, her only remaining relative beside her brother, had assisted her, so she had come. The uncle, under whose care she had been since the death of her mother ten years before, had sent her to a medical college determined to make her a finished physician. But destiny had stepped in. Quite by accident, Miss Radford had discovered that she could write, and the uncle's hope that she might one day grace the medical profession had gone glimmering, completely buried under a mass of experimental manuscript. He professed to have still a ray of hope, until after several of the magazines had accepted Mary's work. Then hope died, and was succeeded by silent acquiescence and patient resignation. Having a knowledge of human nature far beyond that possessed by the average person, the uncle had realized that if Mary's inclination led to literature, it was worse than useless to attempt to interest her in any other profession. Therefore, when she had announced her intention of going west, he had interposed no objection. On the contrary, had urged her to the venture. What might have been his attitude, had not Ben Radford been already in the West, is problematical. Very seldom do we decide a thing until it confronts us. Mary Radford had been surprised at the West. From Ben's cabin in the flat, she had made her first communion with this new world that she had worshipped at first sight. It was as though she had stepped out of an old world into one that was just experiencing the dawn of creation's first morning. At least so it had seemed to her on the morning she had first stepped outside her brother's cabin to view her first sunrise. She had breathed the sweet, moisture-laden breezes that had seemed to almost steal over the flat where she had stood watching the shadows yield to the coming sun. The somber hills had become slowly outlined. The snow caps of the distant mountain peaks glinted with the brilliant shafts that struck them and reflected into the dark recesses below. Nature was king here, and showed its power in a mysterious, though convincing, manner. In the evening there would come a change. Through rifts in the mountains descended the sun, spreading an effulgent expanse of yellow light like burnished gold. In the shadows were reflected numerous colors, all quietly blended, making contrasts of perfect harmony. There were the sinuous buttes that bordered the opposite shore of the river, solemn sentinels guarding the beauty and purity of this virgin land. Near her were sloping hills, dotted with thorny cactus and other prickly plants, and now rose a bald rock spire with its suggestion of grim lonesomeness. In the southern and eastern distances were the plains, silent, vast, unending. It seemed she had come to dwell in a land deserted by some cyclopean race. Its magnificent, unchanging beauty had enthralled her. She had not lacked company. She found that the two diamond punchers were eager to gain her friendship. Marvelous excuses were invented for their appearance at the cabin in the flat. She thought that Ben's friendship was valued above that of all other persons in the surrounding country. But she found the punchers gentlemen. Though their conversation was unique and their idioms picturesque, they compared favorably with the men she had known in the East. 
did they lack the subtleties, they made up for this by their unfailing deference. And they were never rude. Their very bashfulness prevented that. Through them she came to know much of many things. They contrived to acquaint her with the secretive peculiarities of the prairie dog, and, when she would listen with more than ordinary attention, they would loose their wonderful imaginations in the hope of continuing the conversation. Then it was that the subject under discussion would receive exhaustive and altogether unnecessary elucidation. The habits of the prairie dog were not alone betrayed to the ears of the young lady. The sage fowl's inherent weaknesses were paraded before her. The hoot of the owl was imitated with ludicrous solemnity. Other fowl were described with wonderful attention to detail, and the inevitable rattlesnake was pointed out to her as a serpent whose chief occupation in life was that of posing in the shadow of a sagebrush as a target for the revolver of the cowpuncher. The quaintness of the cowboy's speech, his incomparable bashfulness, amused her, while she was strangely affected by his earnestness. She attended to the chickens, and immediately her visitors became interested in them, and fell to discussing them as though they had done nothing all their days but build hen-houses and runways. But she had them on botany. The flower beds were deep, unfathomable mysteries to them, and they stood afar while she cultivated the more difficult plants and encouraged the hardier to increased beauty. But she had not been content to view this land of mystery from her brother's cabin. The dignity of nature had cast its thrall upon her. She was impressed with the sublimity of the climate, the wonderful sunshine, the crystal light of the days, and the quiet peace and beauty of the nights. The lure of the plains had taken her upon long rides, and the cottonwood, filling a goodly portion of the flat, was the scene of many of her explorations. The pony with which her brother had provided her was, Ben Radford declared, a shining example of sterling horse honesty. She did not know that men knew horses quite as well as he knew men, or she would not have allowed him to see the skeptical glance she had thrown over the drowsy-eyed beast that he saddled for her. But she was overjoyed at finding the pony all that her brother had said of it. The little animal was tireless, and often, after a trip over the plains or to dry bottom to mail a letter, she would return by a roundabout trail. Meanwhile, the novel still remained unwritten. Perhaps she had not yet absorbed the local color. Perhaps inspiration was tardy. At all events, she had not written a word. But she was beginning to realize the possibilities. Deep in her soul, something was moving that would presently flow from her pen. It would not be commonplace. That she knew. Real people would move among the pages of her book. Real deeds would be done. And as the days passed, she decided. She would write herself into her book. There would be the first real character. The story would revolve about her and another character, a male one, upon whom she had not decided until the appearance of Ferguson. After he had come, she was no longer undecided. She would make him the hero of her story, the villain she had already met in Leviatt. Something about this man was repellent, she already had a description of him in the notebook that she always carried. Had Leviatt read the things she had written of him, he would have discontinued his visits to the cabin. Several of the two diamond punchers, also, were noted as being possible secondary characters. She had found them very amusing, but the hero would be the one character to whom she would devote the concentrated effort of her mind. She would make him live in the pages, a real, forceful, magnetic human being that the reader would instantly admire. She would bear his soul to the reader. She would reveal his mental processes, not involved, but leading straight and true to... But would she? Had she not so far discovered a certain craftiness in the character of the two-diamond stray man that would indicate subtlety of thought? This knowledge had been growing gradually upon her since their second meeting, and it had become an obstacle that promised difficulties. 
of course she could make Ferguson talk and act as she pleased in the book, but if she wanted a real character, she would have to portray him as he was. To do this would require study. Serious study of any character would inspire faithful delineation. She gave much thought to him now, keeping this purpose in view. She questioned Ben concerning him, but was unable to gain satisfying information. He had been hired by Stafford, her brother told her, holding the position of stray man. I've seen him once down the other side of the cottonwood, the young man had said. He ain't saying much to anyone. Seems to be a quiet sort, and deep. Pretty good sort, though. She was pleased over Ben's brief estimate of the stray man. It vindicated her judgment. Besides, it showed that her brother was not averse to friendship with him. Leviatt she saw with her brother often, and occasionally he came to the cabin. His attitude towards her was one of frank admiration, but he had received no encouragement. How could he know that he was going to be the villain in her book, soon to be written? Shall we take a peep into the mysterious notebook? Yes, for later we shall see much of it. Dave Leviatt, she had written in one place, age thirty-five, tall, slender, walks with a slight stoop. One rather gets the impression that the stoop is a reflection of the man's nature, which seems vindictive and suggests a low cunning. His eyes are small, deep-set, and glitter when he talks, but they are steady and cold, almost merciless. One's thoughts go instantly to the tiger. I shall try to create that impression in the reader's mind. In another place she had jotted this down. I shouldn't want anyone killed in my book, but if I find this to be necessary, Leviatt must do the murder but I think it would be better to have him employ some other person to do it for him. That would give him just the character that would fit him best. I want to make him seem too cowardly. No, not cowardly, because I don't think he is a coward, but too cunning to take chances of being caught. Evidently she had been questioning Ben, for in another place she had written, Ferguson, I must remember this. All cowboys do not carry two guns. Ben does, because he says he is ambidextrous, shooting equally well with either hand. But he does not tie the bottoms of his holsters down, like Ferguson. He says some men do this, but usually they are men who are exceptionally rapid in getting their revolvers out, and that tying down the bottoms of the holsters facilitates removing the weapons. They are accounted to be dangerous men. Ben says when a man is quick to shoot out here, he is called a gunman, and that if he carries two revolvers, he is a two-gun man. Ben laughs at me when I speak of a revolver. They are known merely as guns out here. I must remember this. Ben says that, though he likes Ferguson quite well, he is rather suspicious of him. He seems to be unable to understand why Stafford should employ a two-gun man to look up stray cows. Below this appeared a brief reference to Ferguson. He is not a bit conceited, rather bashful, I should say, but embarrassment in him is attractive. No hero should be conceited. There is a wide difference between impertinence and frankness. Ferguson seems to speak frankly, but with a subtle shade. I think this is a very agreeable trait for a hero in a novel. There followed more interesting scraps concerning Leviatt, which would have caused the range boss many bad moments. And there were interesting bits of description, jotted down when she became impressed with a particularly odd view of the country. But there were no more references to Ferguson. He, being the hero of her novel, must be studied thoroughly. End of chapter 11《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
she made sure of this before seating herself upon a little shelf of rock near a tall cedar half a mile down the river she could see a corner of ben's cabin a section of the corral fence and one of the small outbuildings opposite the cabin across the river rose the buttes that met her eyes always when she came to the cabin door this hill upon which she sat was one that she saw often when in the evening watching the setting sun she followed its golden rays with her eyes many times as the sun had gone slowly down into a rift of the mountains she had seen the crest of this hill shimmering in a saffron light the only spot in the flat that rose above the somber oncoming shadows of the dusk from here it seemed began the rose veil that followed the broad saffron shaft that led straight to the mountains often watching the beauty of the hill during the long sunset she had felt a deep awe stirring her romance was here and mystery it was a spot favored by the sun gods who surrounded it with a glorious halo lingeringly reluctantly withdrawing as the long shadows of the twilight crept over the face of the world it was not her first visit to the hill many times she had come here charmed with the beauty of the view and during one of those visits she had decided that seated on the shelf rock on the summit of the hill she would write the first page of the book it was for this purpose that she had now come after seating herself she opened a small handbag producing therefrom many sheets of paper a much to thumb copy of shakespeare and a pencil she was tempted to begin with a description of the particular bit of country upon which she looked for long ago she had decided upon bare flat for the locale of the story but she sat long nibbling at the end of the pencil delaying the beginning for fear of being unable to do justice to it she began at length making several false starts and beginning anew finally came a paragraph that remained evidently this was satisfactory for another paragraph followed and then another and still another presently a complete page then she looked up with a long-drawn sigh of relief the start had been made she had drawn a word picture of the flat dwelling upon the solitude the desolation the vastness the swimming sunlight the absence of life and movement but as she looked critically comparing what she had written with the reality there came a movement a horseman had ridden into her picture he had come down through a little gully that led into the flat and was loping his pony through the deep sacatone grass toward the cabin it couldn't be ben ben had told her that he intended riding some thirty miles down the river and he couldn't be returning already she leaned forward watching intently the story forgotten the rider kept steadily on for a quarter of an hour then he reached the clearing in which the cabin stood she saw him ride through it and disappear five minutes later he reappeared hesitated at the edge of the clearing and then urged his pony toward the hill upon which he sat as he rode out of the shadows of the trees within an eighth of a mile of her the sunlight shone fairly upon the pony she would have known mustard among many other ponies she drew a sudden deep breath and sat erect tucking back some stray wisps of hair from her forehead did the rider see her for a moment it seemed that the answer would be negative for he disappeared behind some dense shrubbery on the plain below and seemed to be on the point of passing the hill but just at the edge of the shrubbery mustard suddenly swerved and came directly toward her through the corners of her eyes she watched while ferguson dismounted tied mustard close to her own animal and stood a moment quietly regarding her you want to look at the country all by yourself he inquired she pretended a start looking down at him in apparent surprise why she prevaricated i thought there was no one within miles of me she saw his eyes flash in the sunlight of course he drawled there's such an awful darkness that no one could see a pony coming across the flat you think you'll be able to find your way home she flushed guiltily and did not reply she heard him clambering up over the loose stones and presently he stood near her she made a pretense of writing did you stop at the cabin she asked without looking up he regarded her with amused eyes standing loosely his arms folded the fingers of his right hand pulling at his chin 
Did I stop? he repeated. I couldn't rightly say. Seems to me as though I did. You see, I didn't intend to, but I was riding down that way, and I thought I'd stop in and have a talk with Ben. Oh, sometimes even a monosyllable is pregnant with mockery. But he wasn't there. Nobody was there. I wasn't reckoning on everybody running off. She turned and looked straight at him. Why, she said, I shouldn't think our running away would surprise you. You see, you set us an example in running away the other day. He knew instantly that she referred to his precipitate retreat on the night she had hinted that she intended putting him into her story. She shot another glance at him and saw his face redden with embarrassment. But he showed no intention of running now. I've been thinking of what you said, he returned. You couldn't put me into no book. You don't know anything about me. You don't know what I think. Then how could you do it? Of course, she returned, turning squarely around to him and speaking seriously. The story will be fiction, and the plot will have no foundation in fact, but I shall be very careful to have my characters talk and act naturally. To do this, I shall have to study the people whom I wish to characterize. He was moved by an inward mirth. You're still thinking of putting me into the book? he questioned. She nodded, smiling. Then, he said very gravely, you had not to have told me. You didn't show so clever there. Ain't you afraid I'll go to actin' swelled? If I do that, you'd not have the character you wanted. I had thought of that, too, she returned seriously. If you were that kind of a man, I shouldn't want you in the book. How do you know I haven't told you for the purpose of discovering if you would be affected in that manner? He scratched his head, contemplating her gravely. I reckon you're traveling too fast for me, ma'am, he said. His expression of frank amusement was good to see. He stood before her, plainly ready to surrender. Absolutely boyish, he seemed to her. A grown-up boy, to be sure, but with a boy's enthusiasms, impulses, and generosity. Yet in his eyes was something that told of maturity, of conscious power, of perfect trust in his ability to give a good account of himself, even in this country where these qualities constituted the chief rule of life. A strange emotion stirred her. A sudden quickening of the pulse told her that something new had come into her life. She drew a deep, startled breath and felt her cheeks crimsoning. She swiftly turned her head and gazed out over the flat, leaving him standing there, scarcely comprehending her embarrassment. "'I reckon you've been writing some of that book, ma'am,' he said, seeing the papers lying on the rock beside her. "'I don't see why you should want to write a western story.' Do folks in the East get interested in knowing what's going on out here? She suddenly thought of herself. Had she found it interesting? She looked swiftly at him, appraising him from a new viewpoint, feeling a strange new interest in him. It would be strange if they didn't, she returned. It is the only part of the country in which there remains a touch of romance. You must remember that this is a young country that its history began at a comparatively late date. England can write of its feudal barons, France of its ancient aristocracy. But America can look back only to the colonial period, and the West. Maybe you're right, he said, not convinced. But I expect there ain't a heap of romance out here. Leastways, if there is, it manages to keep itself pretty well hid. She smiled, thinking of the romance that surrounded him, of which plainly he was not conscious. To him, romance meant the lights, the crowds, the amusements, the glitter and tinsel of the cities of the East, word of which had come to him through various channels. To her, these things were no longer novel, if they had ever been so, and so for her, romance must come from the new, the unusual, the unconventional. The West was all this. Therefore, romance dwelt here. Of course it all seems commonplace to you, she returned. Perhaps even monotonous. For you have lived here long. He laughed. I've traveled a heap, he said. 
I've been in California, Dakota, Wyoming, Texas, and Arizona. And now I'm here. Saving a man meets different people. This country is pretty much all the same. You must have had a great deal of experience, she said. And you are not very old. He gravely considered her. I would say that I'm about the average age for this country. You see, folks don't live to get very old out here, unless they're mighty careful. And you haven't been careful? He smiled gravely. I expect you wouldn't call it careful, but I'm still living. His words were singularly free from boast. That means that you have escaped the dangers, she said. I have heard that a man's safety in this country depends largely upon his ability to shoot quickly and accurately. I suppose you are accounted a good shot? The question was too direct. His eyes narrowed craftily. I expect you're thinking of that book now, ma'am, he said. There's a heap of men can shoot. You might say they're all good shots. I've told you about the men who can't shoot good. They're either mighty careful or they ain't here any more. It's always one or the other. Oh, dear, she exclaimed, shuddering slightly. In that case, I suppose the hero in my story will have to be a good shot, she laughed. I shouldn't want him to get halfway through the story and then be killed because he was clumsy in handling his weapon. I'm beginning to believe that I shall have to make him a two-gun man. I understand they are supposed to be very good shots. I've seen them that wasn't, he returned gravely and shortly. How did you prove that? she asked suddenly, but he was not to be snared. I didn't say I proved it, he stated, but I've seen it proved. How proved? Why, he said, his eyes glinting with amusement, they ain't here any more, ma'am. Oh. Then it doesn't follow that because a man wears two guns he is more likely to survive than is the man who wears only one? I reckon not, ma'am. I see that you have the bottoms of your holsters tied down, she said, looking at them. Why have you done that? Well, he declared, drawing his words a little, I always found that there ain't any use of taking chances on an accident. You mightn't live to tell about it. And having the bottoms of your holsters tied down keeps your guns from snagging. I've seen men whose guns got snagged when they wanted to use them. They wasn't so active after. Then I shall have to make my hero a two-gun man, she said. That is decided. Now, the next thing to do is to give some attention to his character. I think he ought to be absolutely fearless and honest and incapable of committing a dishonorable deed. Don't you think so? While they had talked, he had come closer to her and stood beside the shelf rock, one foot resting on it. At her question, he suddenly looked down at the foot, shifting it nervously, while a flush started from the blue scarf at his throat and slowly suffused his face. Don't you think so? she repeated her eyes meeting his for an instant why of course ma'am he suddenly answered the words coming sharply as though he had only at that instant realized the import of the question why she said aware of his embarrassment don't you think there are such men i expect there are ma'am he returned but in this country there's a heap of argument could be made about what would be dishonorable if your two-gun man should happen to be a horse thief or a rustler, I reckon we could get at it right off. He shan't be either of those, she declared stoutly. I don't think he would stoop to such contemptible deeds. In the story, he is employed by a ranch owner to kill a rustler whom the owner imagines has been stealing his cattle. His hands were suddenly behind him, the fingers clenched. His eyes searched her face with an alert, intense gaze. His embarrassment was gone. His expression was saturnine. His eyes narrowed with a slight mockery. And his voice came cold, deliberate, even. I reckon you've got your gunman true to life, ma'am, he said. 
She laughed lightly, amused over the sudden change that she saw and felt in him. Of course the gunman doesn't really intend to kill the rustler, she said. I don't believe I shall have anyone killed in the story. The gunman is merely attracted by the sum of money promised him by the ranch owner, and when he accepts it is only because he is in dire need of work. Don't you think that could be possible? That could happen easy in this country, ma'am, he returned. She laughed delightedly. That vindicates my judgment, she declared. He was regarding her with unwavering eyes. Is that gunman going to be the hero in your story, ma'am? he asked quietly. Why, of course. And I'm to be him? She gave him a defiant glance, though she blushed immediately. Why do you ask? she questioned in reply. You need have no fear that I will compel my hero to do anything dishonorable. I ain't fearing anything, he returned. But I'd like to know how you come to think of that. Do writers make them things up out of their own minds, or does someone tell them? Those things generally have their origin in the mind of the writer, she replied. Meaning that you thought of that yourself, he persisted. Of course. He lifted his foot from the rock and stood looking gravely at her. In most of the books I've read, there's always a villain. I reckon you're going to have one. There will be a villain, she returned. His eyes flashed queerly. Would you mind telling me who you have picked out for your villain? He continued. I don't mind, she said. It is Leviatt. He suddenly grinned broadly and held out his right hand to her. Shake, ma'am, he said. I reckon if I was writing a book, Leviatt would be the villain. She rose from the rock and took his outstretched hand, her eyes drooping as they met his. He felt her hand tremble a little, and he looked at it, marveling. She glanced up, saw him looking at her hand, swiftly withdrew it, and turned from him, looking down into the flat at the base of the hill. She started, uttering the sharp command, Look! Perhaps a hundred yards distant, sitting on his pony in a lounging attitude, was a horseman. While they looked, the horseman removed his broad-brimmed hat, bowed mockingly, and urged his pony out into the flat. It was Leviatt. On the slight breeze, a laugh floated back to them, short, sharp, and mocking. For a time, they stood silent, watching the departing rider. Then Ferguson's lips wreathed into a feline smile. Kind of dramatic, him riding up that way, he said. Don't you think putting him in the book will spoil it, ma'am? End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Do you smoke? Leviatt rode down through the gully where Miss Radford had first caught sight of Ferguson when he had entered the flat. He disappeared in this, and five minutes later came out upon a ridge above it. The distance was too great to observe whether he turned to look back, but just before he disappeared, finally, they saw him sweep his hat from his head. It was a derisive motion, and Miss Radford colored and shot a furtive glance at Ferguson. The latter stood loosely beside her, his hat brim pulled well down over his forehead. As she looked, she saw his eyes narrow and his lips curve ironically. What do you suppose he thought? she questioned, her eyes drooping away from his. Him? Ferguson laughed. I expect you could see from his actions that he wasn't a heap tickled. Some thought was moving him mightily. He chuckled gleefully. Now, if you could only put what he was thinking into your book, ma'am, it sure would make interest in reading. But he saw you holding my hand, she declared, aware of the uselessness of telling him this, but unable to repress her indignation over the thought that Leviatt had seen. Why, well, I expect he did, ma'am, he returned, trying hard to keep the pleasure out of his voice. You see, he must have been looking right at us, but there ain't nothing to be flustered over. I reckon that some day, if he's around, he'll see me holding your hand again. The red in her cheeks deepened. Why, how conceited you are, 
she said, trying to be very severe, but only succeeding in making him think that her eyes were prettier than he had thought. I don't think I'm conceited, ma'am, he returned, smiling. I've liked you right well since the beginning. I don't think it's conceit to tell a lady that you're thinking of holding her hand. She was looking straight at him, trying to be very defiant. And so you have liked me, she taunted. I am considering whether to tell you that I was not thinking of you as a possible admirer. His eyes flashed. I don't think you mean that, ma'am, he said. You ain't treated me like you treated some others. Some others? She questioned, not comprehending. He laughed. Them other two diamond men that uh, took a shine to you. I've heard that you talk right sassy to them, but you ain't never been sassy to me. Leastways, you ain't never told me to evaporate. She was suddenly convulsed. They have told you that? She questioned. And then, not waiting for an answer, she continued more soberly. And so you thought that in view of what I have said to those men, you have been treated comparatively civilly. I am afraid I have underestimated you. Hereafter I shall talk less intimately to you. I wouldn't do that, ma'am, he pleaded. You don't need to be afraid that I'll be too fresh. Oh, dear, she exclaimed with a pretense of delight. It will be very nice to know that I can talk to you without fear of you're placing a false construction on my words, but I'm not afraid of you. He stepped back from the rock, hitching at his cartridge belt. I'm going over to the two diamond now, ma'am, he said. And since you've said you ain't afraid of me, I'm asking you if you won't go riding with me tomorrow. There's a right pretty stretch of country about fifteen miles up the creek that you'd be tickled over. Should she tell him that she had explored all of the country within thirty miles? The words trembled on her lips, but remained unspoken. Why, I don't know, she objected. Do you think it is quite safe? He smiled and stepped away from her, looking back over his shoulder. Thank you, ma'am, he said. I'll ride over for you sometime in the morning. He continued down the hill, loose stones rattling ahead of him. She looked after him, radiant. But I didn't say I would go, she called. And then, receiving no answer to this, she waited until he had swung into the saddle and was waving a farewell to her. Don't come before ten o'clock, she advised. She saw him smile, and then she returned to her manuscript. When the sun gods kissed the crest of the hill and bathed her in the rich rose colors that came straight down to the hill through the rift in the mountains, she rose and gathered up her papers. She had not written another line. It was late in the afternoon when Leviatt rode up to the door of Stafford's office and dismounted. He took plenty of time walking the short distance that lay between him and the door, and growled a savage reply to a loafing puncher who asked him a question. Once in the office he dropped glumly into a chair, his eyes glittering vengefully as his gaze rested on Stafford, who sat at his desk engaged in his accounts. Through the open window Stafford had seen the range boss coming, and therefore when the latter had entered he had not looked up. Presently he finished his work and drew back from the desk. Then he took up a pipe, filled it with tobacco, lighted it, and puffed with satisfaction. Nothing's happened? he questioned, glancing at his range boss. Leviatt's reply was short. Nah, drop down to see how things was running. Things is quiet, returned Stafford. There ain't been any cattle missed for a long time. I reckon a new stray man is doing some good. Leviatt's eyes glowed. If you call gassin' with Mary Radford doing good, well then, he's doing it, he snapped. I ain't heard that he's doing that, returned Stafford. I'm telling you about it now, said Leviatt. I seen him today, him and her holding hands on top of a hill in Bear Flat, he sneered. He's a better ladies' man than a gunfighter. I reckon we made a mistake in picking him up. Stafford smiled indulgently. He's certainly a good looker, he said. I reckon some girls would take a shine to him. But I ain't questioning his shooting. 
I've been in this country a right smart while, and I ain't never seen another man that could bore a can six times while it's in the air. Leviatt's lips drooped. He could do that and not have nerve enough to shoot a coyote. Him not clashing with Ben Radford proves he ain't got nerve. Stafford smiled. The story of how the stray man had closed Leviatt's mouth was still fresh in his memory. He was wondering whether Leviatt knew that he had heard about the incident. Suppose you try him, he suggested. That'd be as good a way as any to find out if he's got nerve. Leviatt's face bloated poisonously, but he made no answer. Apparently unaware that he had touched a tender spot, Stafford continued, Maybe his game is to get in with the girl, figuring that he'll be more liable that way to get a chance at being Radford. But whatever his game is, I ain't interfering. He's got a season contract, and I ain't breaking my word with the cuss. I ain't taking no chances with him. Leviatt rose abruptly, his face swelling with an anger that he was trying hard to suppress. He better not go to fooling with Mary Radford, damn him, he snapped. I reckon that wind is blowing in two directions, grinned Stafford. When I see him, I'll tell him. A clatter of hoofs reached the ears of the two men, and Stafford turned to the window. Here's the stray man now, he said gravely. Both men were silent when Ferguson reached the door. He stood just inside, looking at Stafford and Leviatt with cold, alert eyes. He nodded shortly to Stafford, not removing his gaze from the range boss. The latter deliberately turned his back and looked out the window. There was insolence in the movement, but apparently it had no effect upon the stray man, beyond bringing a queer twitch into the corners of his mouth. He smiled at Stafford. "'Anything new?' questioned the latter, as he had questioned Leviatt. "'Nothing doing,' returned Ferguson. Leviatt now turned from the window. He spoke to Stafford, sneering. "'Ben Radford's quite a piece away from where he's hanging out,' he said. He again turned to the window. Ferguson's lips smiled, but his eyes narrowed. Stafford stiffened in his chair. He watched the stray man's hands furtively, fearing the outcome of this meeting. But Ferguson's hands were nowhere near his guns. They were folded over his chest, lightly, the fingers of his right hand caressing his chin. "'You riding up the crick today?' he questioned of Leviatt. His tone was mild, yet there was a peculiar quality in it that hinted at hardness. "'Nah,' answered Leviatt, without turning. Ferguson began rolling a cigarette. When he had done this, he lighted it and puffed slowly. "'Well, now,' he said, "'that's mighty peculiar. I'd swore that I saw you over at Bear Flat.' Leviatt turned. "'You've been picking posies too long with Mary Radford,' he sneered. Ferguson smiled. "'Maybe I have,' he returned. "'There's them that she'll let pick posies with her, and them that she won't.' Leviatt's face crimsoned with anger. "'I reckon if you hadn't been monkeying around too much with the girl, you'd have run across that dead two-diamond cow and the dogie that she left,' he sneered. Ferguson's lips straightened. "'How far off was you standing when that cow died?' he drawled. A curse writhed through Leviatt's lips. "'Why, you damned—' "'Don't,' warned Ferguson. He coolly stepped toward Leviatt, holding by the thongs the leather tobacco pouch from which he had obtained the tobacco to make his cigarette. When he had approached close to the range boss, he held the pouch up before his eyes. "'I reckon you better have a smoke,' he said quietly. "'They say it's good for the nerves.' He took a long pull at the cigarette. It's pretty fair tobacco, he continued. I found it about ten miles up the creek on a ridge above a dry arroyo. I reckon it's yarn. It's got your initials on it. The eyes of the two men met in a silent battle. Leviatt's were the first to waver. Then he reached out and took the pouch. It's mine, he said shortly. Again he looked straight at Ferguson, his eyes carrying a silent message. You see anything else? he questioned. Ferguson smiled. I ain't saying anything about anything else, he returned. Thus, unsuspectingly, did Stafford watch and listen while these two men arranged to carry on their war man to man, 
neither asking any favor from the man who, with a word, might have settled it. With his reply that he wasn't saying anything about anything else, Ferguson had told Leviatt that he had no intention of telling his suspicions to any man, nor from this moment would Leviatt dare whisper a derogatory word into the manager's ear concerning Ferguson. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Two-Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn On the Edge of the Plateau Now that Ferguson was satisfied beyond doubt that Leviatt had been concealed in the thicket above the bed of the arroyo where he had come upon the dead two-diamond cow, there remained but one disturbing thought. Who was the man he had seen riding along the ridge away from the arroyo? Until he discovered the identity of the rider, he must remain absolutely in the dark concerning Leviatt's motive in concealing the name of the other actor in the incident. He was positive that Leviatt knew the rider, but he was equally positive that Leviatt would keep this knowledge to himself. But on this morning he was not much disturbed over the mystery. Other things were troubling him. Would Miss Radford go riding with him? Would she change her mind overnight? As he rode, he consulted his silver timepiece. She had told him not to come before ten. The hands of his watch pointed to ten-thirty when he entered the flat, and it was near eleven when he rode up to the cabin door to find Miss Radford arrayed in riding skirt, dainty boots, gauntleted gloves, blouse, and soft felt hat awaiting him at the door. "'You're late,' she said, smiling as she came out upon the porch. If he had been less wise, he might have told her that she had told him not to come until after ten, and that he had noticed that she had been waiting for him in spite of her apparent reluctance of yesterday. But he steered carefully away from this pitfall. He dismounted and threw the bridle rein over Mustard's head, coming around beside the porch. "'I wasn't thinking to hurry you, ma'am.' he said. But I reckon we'll go now. It's certainly a fine day for riding. He stood silent for a moment, looking about him. Then he flushed. Why, I'm getting right box-headed, ma'am, he declared. Here I am standing and making you sick with my palaver, and your horse waiting to be caught up. He stepped quickly to Mustard's side and uncoiled his rope. She stood on the porch, watching him as he proceeded to the corral, caught the pony, and flung a bridle on it. Then he led the animal to the porch and cinched the saddle carefully. Throwing the reins over the pommel of the saddle, he stood at the animal's head, waiting. She came to the edge of the porch, placed a slender booted foot into the ox-bow stirrup, and swung gracefully up. In an instant he had vaulted into his own saddle, and together they rode out upon the gray-white floor of the flat. They rode two miles, keeping near the fringe of cottonwoods, and presently mounted a long slope. Half an hour later, Miss Radford looked back and saw the flat spread out behind, silent, vast, deserted, slumbering in the swimming white sunlight. A little later, she looked again, and the flat was no longer there, for they had reached the crest of the slope, and their trail had wound them round to a broad level, from which began another slope several miles distant. They had ridden for more than two hours, talking very little, when they reached the crest of the last rise and saw, spreading before them, a level many miles wide, stretching away in three directions. It was a grass plateau, but the grass was dry and drooping and rustled under the pony's hooves. There were no trees, but a post-oak thicket skirted the southern edge, and it was toward this that he urged his pony. She followed, smiling to think that he was deceiving himself in believing that she had not yet explored this place. They came close to the thicket, and he swung off his horse and stood at her stirrup. "'I was wanting you to see the country from here,' he said, as he helped her down. She watched him while he picketed the horses, so that they might not stray. Then they went together to the edge of the thicket, seating themselves in a welcome shade. At their feet, 
the plateau dropped sheer as though cut with a knife and a little way out from the base lay a narrow ribbon of water that flowed slowly in its rocky bed winding around the base of a small hill spreading over a shallow bottom and disappearing between the buttes further down everything beneath them was distinguishable though distant knobs rose here there a flat spread mountains frowned in the distance but so far away that they seemed like paper mache shapes towering in a sea of blue like a map the country seemed as miss radford and ferguson looked down upon it yet a big map over which one might wonder more vast more nearly perfect richer in detail than any that could be evolved from the talents of man ridges valleys gullies hills knobs and draws were all laid out in a vast basin miss radford's gaze swept down into a section of flat near the river why there are some cattle down there she exclaimed sure he returned there are two diamond way off there behind that ridge is where the wagon is he pointed to a long range of flat hills that stretched several miles the boys that are working on the other side of that ridge can't see them cattle like we can looks plumb ridiculous there are no men with those cattle down there she said pointing to those below in the flat no he returned quietly they're all off on the other side of the ridge she smiled demurely at him then we won't be interrupted as we were yesterday she said did she know this was why he had selected this spot for the end of the ride he looked quickly at her but answered slowly they couldn't see us he said if we was out in the open we'd be right on the skyline then anyone could see us we got this thicket behind us and i reckon from down there we'd be pretty near invisible he turned around clasping his hands about one knee and looked squarely at her i expect you done a heap with your book yesterday after i went away her cheeks colored a little under his straight gaze i didn't stay there long she equivocated but i got some very good ideas and i'm glad that i didn't write much i should have to destroy it because i have decided upon a different beginning ben made the trip to dry bottom yesterday and last night he told something that had happened there that has given me some very good material for a beginning that's awful interesting he observed so now you'll be able to start your book with something that really happened real and original she returned with a quick glance at him ben told me that about a month ago some men had a shooting match in dry bottom they used a can for a target and one man kept it in the air until he put six bullet holes through it ben says he is pretty handy with his weapons but he could never do that he insists that few men can and he is inclined to think that the man who did do it must have been a gunfighter i suppose you have never tried it over his lips while she had been speaking had crept the slight mocking smile which always told better than words of the cold cynicism that moved him at times did she know anything did she suspect him the smile masked an interest that illumined his eyes very slightly as he looked at her i expect that is plum slick shootin he returned slowly but well, some men can do it i've knowed em but i ain't heard that it's been done lately in this here country i reckon ben told you something of how this man looked he had succeeded in putting the question very casually and she had not caught the note of deep interest in his voice why it's very odd she said looking him over carefully from ben's description i should assume that the man looked very like you if her reply had startled him he gave little evidence of it he sat perfectly quiet gazing with steady eyes out over the big basin for a time she sat silent also her gaze following his then she turned that would be odd wouldn't it 
she said. What would, he answered, not looking at her. Why, if you were the man who had done that shooting, it would follow out the idea of my plot perfectly. For in my story, the hero is hired to shoot a supposed rustler, and of course he would have to be a good shot. And since Ben has told me the story of the shooting match, I have decided that the hero in my story shall be tested in that manner before being employed to shoot the rustler. Then he comes to the supposed rustler's cabin, and meets the heroine, in much the same manner that you came. Now, if it should turn out that you were the man who did the shooting in Dry Bottom, my story up to this point would be very nearly real. And that would be fine. She had allowed a little enthusiasm to creep into her voice, and he looked up at her quickly, a queer expression in his eyes. You gonna have your two-gun man bit by a rattler? he questioned. Well, I don't know about that. It would make very little difference. But I should be delighted to find that you were the man who did the shooting over at Dry Bottom. Say that you are. Even now he could not tell whether there was subtlety in her voice. The old doubt rose again in his mind. Was she really serious in saying that she intended putting all this in her story? Or was this a ruse, concealing an ulterior purpose? Suppose she and her brother suspected him of being the man who had participated in the shooting match in Dry Bottom. Suppose the brother, or she, had invented this tale about the book to draw him out. He was moved to an inward humor, amused to think that either of them should imagine him shallow enough to be caught thus. But what if they did catch him? Would they gain by it? They could gain nothing, but the knowledge would serve to put them on their guard. But if she did suspect him, what use was there in evasion or denial? He smiled whimsically. I reckon your story is going to be real up to this point, he returned. A while back I did shoot at a kin in Dry Bottom. She gave an exclamation of delight. Now, isn't that marvelous? No one shall be able to say that my beginning will be strictly fiction. She leaned closer to him, her eyes alight with eagerness. Now, please don't say that you are the man who shot the can five times she pleaded. I shouldn't want my hero to be beaten at anything he undertook. But I know that you were not beaten, were you? He smiled gravely. I reckon I wasn't beat, he returned. She sat back and surveyed him with satisfaction. I knew it, she stated, as though in her mind there had never existed any doubt of the fact. Now, she said, plainly pleased over the result of her questioning, I shall be able to proceed, entirely confident that my hero will be able to give a good account of himself in any situation. Her eyes baffled him. He gave up watching her and turned to look at the world beneath him. He would have given much to know her thoughts. She had said that, from her brother's description of the man who had won the shooting match at Dry Bottom, she would assume that that man had looked very like him. Did her brother hold this opinion also? Ferguson cared very little if he did. He was accustomed to danger, and he had gone into this business with his eyes open. And if Ben did know, unconsciously, his lips straightened and his chin went forward slightly, giving his face an expression of hardness that made him look ten years older. Watching him, the girl drew a slow, full breath. It was a side of his character with which she was as yet unacquainted, and she marveled over it, comparing it to the side she already knew, the side that he had shown her, quiet, thoughtful, subtle. And now, at a glance, she saw him as men knew him, unyielding, unafraid, indomitable. Yet there was much in this sudden revelation of character to admire, she liked a man whom other men respected for the very traits that his expression had revealed. No man would be likely to adopt an air of superiority toward him. None would attempt to trifle with him. She felt that she ought not to trifle. But moved by some unaccountable impulse, she laughed. He turned his head at the laugh and looked quizzically at her. I hope you are not thinking of killing someone, she taunted. 
His right hand slowly clenched. Something metallic suddenly glinted his eyes, to be succeeded instantly by a slight mockery. "'You afraid someone's going to be killed?' he inquired slowly. "'Well, no,' she returned, startled by the question. "'But you look so... so determined that I... I thought... He suddenly seized her arm and drew her around so that she faced the little stretch of plain near the ridge about which they had been speaking previously. His lips were in straight lines again, his eyes gleaming interestedly. "'You see that man down there among them cattle?' he questioned. Following his gaze, she saw a man among perhaps a dozen cattle. At the moment she looked, the man had swung a rope, and she saw the loop fall true over the head of a cow the man had selected, saw the pony pivot and drag the cow prone. Then the man dismounted, ran swiftly to the side of the fallen cow, and busied himself about her hind legs. "'What is he doing?' she asked, a sudden excitement shining in her eyes. "'He's hog-tying her now,' returned Ferguson. She knew what that meant. She had seen Ben throw cattle in this manner when he was branding them. Hog-tying meant binding their hind legs with a short piece of rope to prevent struggling while the brand was being applied. Apparently this was what the man was preparing to do. Smoke from a nearby fire curled lazily upward, and about this fire the man now worked, evidently turning some branding irons. He gave some little time to this, and while Miss Radford watched, she heard Ferguson's voice again. "'I reckon we're going to see some fun pretty soon,' he said quietly. "'Why?' she inquired quickly. He smiled. "'Do you see that man riding through that break in the ridge?' he asked, pointing the place out to her. She nodded, puzzled by his manner. He continued dryly. "'Well, if that man that comes through the break is what he ought to be, he'll be shooting pretty soon.' "'Why?' she gasped catching at his sleeve. Why should he shoot? He laughed again, grimly. Well, he returned, if a puncher catches a rustler with the goods on, he's got a heap of right to do some shooting. She shuddered. And do you think that man among the cattle is a rustler? She asked. Wait, he advised, peering intently toward the ridge. Why, he continued presently, there's another man riding this way, and he's hiding from the other, keeping in the gullies and the draws so the first man can't see him if he looks back. He laughed softly. It's plumb ridiculous. Here we are, able to see all that's going on down there and not able to take a hand in it. And there's them three going ahead with what they're thinking about, not knowing that we're watching them, and two of them not knowing that the third man is watching. I call that plumb ridiculous. The first man was still riding through the break in the ridge, coming boldly, apparently unconscious of the presence of the man among the cattle, who was well concealed from the first man's eyes by a rocky promontory at the corner of the break. The third man was not over an eighth of a mile behind the first man, and riding slowly and carefully. At the rate the first man was riding, not five minutes would elapse before he would come out into the plain full upon the point where the man among the cattle was working at his fire. Ferguson and Miss Radford watched the scene with interest. Plainly the first man was intruding. Or, if not, he was the rustler's confederate, and the third man was spying upon him. Miss Radford and Ferguson were to discover the key to the situation presently. "'Do you think that man among the cattle is a rustler?' questioned Miss Radford. In her excitement, she had pressed very close to Ferguson, and was clutching his arm very tightly. "'I reckon he is,' returned Ferguson. "'I ain't rememberin' that any ranch has cows that run the range unbranded, especially when the cow has got a calf. Unless that cow is a maverick, and, and that ain't likely, since she's running with the two-diamond bunch.' He leaned forward, for the man had left the fire and was running toward the fallen cow. Once at her side, the man bent over her, pressing the hot irons against the bottoms of her hooves. A thin wreath of smoke curled upward. The cow struggled. Ferguson looked at Miss Radford. "'Burnt her hoofs,' he said shortly. 
so she can't follow when he runs her calf off. The brute, declared Miss Radford, her face paling with anger. The man was fumbling with the rope that bound the cow's legs when the first man rode around the edge of the break and came full upon him. From the distance at which Miss Radford and Ferguson watched, they could not see the expression on either man's face, but they saw the rustler's right hand move downward and saw his pistol glitter in the sunlight. But the pistol was not raised. The first man's pistol had appeared just a fraction of a second sooner, and they saw that it was poised, menacing the rustler. For an instant the two men were motionless. Ferguson felt the grasp on his arm tighten, and he turned his head to see Miss Radford's face, pale and drawn, her eyes lifted to his with a slow, dawning horror in them. Oh, she exclaimed, they're going to shoot. She withdrew her hand from Ferguson's arm and held it with the other to her ears, cringing away from the edge of the cliff. She waited breathless for, it seemed to her, the space of several minutes. Her head turned from the men, her eyes closed for fear that she might, in the dread of the moment, look toward the plain. She kept telling herself that she would not turn, but presently, in spite of her determination, the suspense was too great, and she turned quickly and fearfully, expecting to see at least one riderless horse. That would have been horrible enough. To her surprise, both men still kept the positions that they had held when she had turned away. The newcomer's revolver still menaced the rustler. She looked up into Ferguson's face to see a grim smile on it, to see his eyes chilled and narrowed, fixed steadily upon the two horsemen. Oh, she said, is it over? Ferguson heard the question and smiled mirthlessly without turning his head. I reckon it ain't over, yet he returned but i expect it'll be over pretty soon if that guy that's got his gun on the rustler don't get a move on right quick that other guy's coming round the corner of that break and if he's the rustler's friend that man with the gun will get his pretty rapid his voice raised a trifle a slightly anxious note in it why don't the damn fool turn around he could see that last man now if he did now what do you think of that Ferguson's voice was sharp and tense, and in spite of herself, Miss Radford's gaze shifted again to the plains below her. Fascinated, her fear succumbing to the intense interest of the moment, she followed the movements of the trio. From around the corner of the break, the third man had ridden. He was not over a hundred feet from the man who had caught the rustler, and he was walking his horse now. The watchers on the edge of the plateau could see that he had taken in the situation and was stealing upon the captor, who sat in his saddle, his back to the advancing rider. Drawing a little closer, the third man stealthily dropped from his pony and crept forward. The significance of the movement dawned upon Miss Radford in a flash, and she again seized Ferguson's arm, tugging at it fiercely. "'Why, he's going to kill that man!' she cried. "'Can't you do something?' For mercy's sake, do. Shout or shoot off your pistol. Do something to warn him. Ferguson flashed a swift glance at her, and she saw that his face wore a queer pallor. His expression had grown grimmer, but he smiled, a little sadly, she thought. It ain't a bit of use trying to do anything, he returned, his gaze again upon the men. We're two miles from them men and a thousand feet above them. There ain't any pistol report going to stop what's going on down there. All we can do is watch. Maybe we can recognize one of them. Shucks. The exclamation was called from him by a sudden movement on the part of the captor. The third man must have made a noise, for the captor turned sharply. At the instant he did so, the rustler's pistol flashed in the sunlight. The watchers on the plateau did not hear the report at once and when they did, it came to them only faintly, a slight sound which was barely distinguishable. But they saw a sudden spurt of flame and smoke. The captor reeled drunkenly in his saddle, caught blindly at the pommel, and then slid slowly down into the grass of the plains. Ferguson drew a deep breath, and, turning, looked sharply at Miss Radford. She had covered her face with her hands, and was swaying dizzily, 
He was up from the rock in a flash and was supporting her, leading her away from the edge of the plateau. She went unresisting, her slender figure shuddering spasmodically, her hands still covering her face. Oh, she exclaimed as the horror of the scene rose in her mind, the brutes, the brutes. Feeling that if he kept quiet, she would recover from the shock of the incident sooner, Ferguson said nothing in reply to her outbreaks as he led her toward the ponies. For a moment, after reaching them, she leaned against her animal's shoulder, her face concealed from Ferguson by the pony's mane. Then he was at her side, speaking firmly. "'You must get away from here,' he said. "'I ought to have got you away before... before that happened.' She looked up, showing him a pair of wide, dry eyes in which there was still a trace of horror. An expression of grave self-accusation shone in his. "'You were not to blame,' she said dully. "'You may have anticipated a meeting of those men, but you could not have foreseen the end.' "'Oh,' she shuddered again, "'to think of seeing a man deliberately murdered.' "'That's just what it was,' he returned quietly. "'Just plain murder.' They had him between em. He didn't have a chance. He was bound to get it from one or the other. Looks like they trapped him, run him down there on purpose. He held her stirrup. I reckon you've seen enough, ma'am, he added. You better hop right on your horse and get back to Bear Flat. She shivered and raised her head, looking at him, a flash of fear in her eyes. You are going down there, she cried, her eyes dilating. He laughed grimly. I certainly am, ma'am, he returned. You better go right off. I'm riding down there to see how bad that man is hit. She started toward him, protesting. Why, they will kill you, too, she declared. He laughed again with a sudden grim humor. There ain't any danger, he returned. They've sloped. Involuntarily, she looked down. Far out on the plains, through the break in the ridge in the hills, she could see two horsemen racing away. "'The cowards!' she cried, her voice shaking with anger. "'To shoot a man in cold blood and then run!' She looked at Ferguson, her figure stiffening with decision. "'If you go down there, I'm going too,' she declared. "'He might need some help,' she added, seeing the objection in his eyes. And if he does, I may be able to give it to him. You know, she continued, smiling wanly, I have had some experience with sick people. He said nothing more, but silently assisted her into the saddle and swung into his own. They urged the animals to a rapid pace, she following him eagerly. It was a rough trail, leading through many gullies around miniature hills into bottoms where huge boulders and treacherous sand barred the way, along the face of dizzy cliffs, and through lava beds where the footing was uncertain and dangerous. But in an hour they were on the plains and riding toward the break in the ridge of hills where the shooting had been done. The man's pony had moved off a little and was grazing unconcernedly when they arrived. A brown heap in the grass told where the man lay, and presently Ferguson was down beside him, one of his limp wrists between his fingers. He stood up after a moment to confront Miss Radford, who had fallen behind during the last few minutes of the ride. Ferguson's face was grave, and there was a light in his eyes that thrilled her for a moment as she looked at him. "'He ain't dead, ma'am,' he said as he assisted her down from her pony. The bullet got him in the shoulder. She caught a queer note in his voice, something approaching appeal. She looked swiftly at him, suspicious. Do you know him? she asked. I reckon I do, ma'am, he returned. It's Rope Jones. Once he stood by me when he thought I needed a friend. If there's any chance, I'm going to get him to your cabin, where you can take care of him till he gets over this if he ever does. She realized now how this tragedy had shocked her. She reeled, and the world swam dizzily before her. Again she saw Ferguson dart forward, but she steadied herself and smiled reassuringly. 
it is merely the thought that i must now put my little knowledge to a severe test she said it rather frightened me i don't know whether anything can be done she succeeded in forcing herself to calmness and gave orders rapidly get something under his head she commanded no that will be too high she added as she saw ferguson start to unbuckle the saddle cinch on his pony raise his head only a very little that round thing that you have fastened to your saddle the slicker will do very well there now get some water she was down beside the wounded man in another instant cutting away a section of the shirt near the shoulder with a knife that she had borrowed from ferguson the wound had not bled much and was lower than ferguson had thought but she gave it what care she could and when ferguson arrived with water from the river a mile away she dressed the wound and applied water to rope's forehead soon she saw that her efforts were to be of little avail rope lay pitifully slack and unresponsive at the end of an hour's work ferguson bent over her with a question on his lips do you reckon he'll come round ma'am she shook her head negatively the bullet has lodged somewhere possibly in the lung she returned it entered just above the heart and he has bled much internally he may never regain consciousness ferguson's face paled with a sudden anger in that case ma'am we'll never know who shot him he said slowly and i'm wantin to know that couldn't you fetch him too ma'am just long enough so as i could ask him she looked up with a slow glance i can try she said is there any more whiskey in your flask he produced the flask and they had both bent over rope forcing a generous portion of the liquor down his throat then alternately bathing the wound in his forehead they watched they were rewarded presently by a faint flicker of the eyelids and a slow flow of color in the pale cheeks then after a little the eyes opened in an instant ferguson's lips were close to rope's ear who shot you rope old man he said eagerly you don't need to be afraid to tell me it's ferguson the wounded man's eyes were glazed with a dull incomprehension but slowly as though at last he was faintly conscious of the significance of the question his eyes glinted with the steady light of returning reason suddenly he smiled his lips opening slightly both watchers leaned tensely forward to catch the low words ferguson told me to look out he mumbled he told me to be careful that they didn't get me between em i wasn't thinking it would happen just that way and now his eyes opened scornfully and he struggled and lifted himself upon one arm gazing at some imaginary object why he said slowly and distinctly his voice cold and metallic you're a hell of a range boss why you he broke off suddenly his eyes fixed full upon miss radford why it's a woman and i thought why ma'am he went on apologetically i didn't know you was there but you ain't gonna run off no calf while i'm looking at you shucks won't the old man be some surprised to know that tucson and he shuddered spasmodically and sat erect with a great effort you got me damn you he sneered but well, you won't never get anyone he swung his right hand over his head as though the hand held a pistol but the arm suddenly dropped he shuddered again and sank slowly back his eyes wide and staring but unseeing ferguson looked sharply at miss radford who was suddenly bending over the prostrate man her head on his breast she arose after a little tears starting to her eyes he is gone she said slowly end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the two gun man by charles alden seltzer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. A Free Hand. 
It was near midnight when Ferguson rode in to the Two Diamond Ranch House, leading Rope's pony. He carefully unsaddled the two animals and let them into the corral, taking great pains to make little noise. Rope's saddle, a peculiar one with a high pommel bearing a silver plate upon which the puncher's name was engraved, he placed conspicuously near the door of the bunkhouse. His own he carefully suspended from its accustomed hook in the lean-to. Then, still carefully, he made his way inside the bunkhouse and sought his bunk. At dawn he heard voices outside, and he arose and went to the door. Several of the men were gathered about the step, talking. For an instant Ferguson stood, his eyes roving over the group. Tucson was not there. He went back into the bunkhouse and walked casually about, taking quick glances at the bunks where the men still slept. Then he returned to the door, satisfied that Tucson had not come in. When he reached the door again, he found that the men of the group had discovered the saddle. One of them was saying something about it. "'That ain't just the way I take care of my saddle,' he was telling the others. "'Leaving her out nights.' "'I never know rope to be that careless before,' said another. Ferguson returned to the bunkhouse and ate breakfast. After the meal was finished, he went out, caught up mustard, swung into the saddle, and rode down to the ranch house door. He found Stafford in the office. The latter greeted the stray man with a smile. "'Something doing?' he questioned. "'You might call it that,' returned Ferguson. He went inside and seated himself near Stafford's desk. "'I come in to tell you I saw some rustlers working on the herd yesterday,' he said. Stafford sat suddenly erect, his eyes lighting interrogatively. "'It wasn't Ben Radford,' continued Ferguson, answering the look. "'You'd be surprised if I told you. But I ain't telling now. I'm waiting to see if someone else does. But I'm telling you this. They got Rope Jones.' Stafford's face reddened with anger. "'They got Rope, you say?' he demanded. "'Why, where? Damn em? Back of the ridge, about fifteen mile up the creek, returned Ferguson. I was riding along the ridge of the plateau, and I saw a man down there shoot another. I got down as soon as I could and found rope. There wasn't nothing I could do. So I planted him where I found him and brought his horse back. There was two rustlers there, but only one done the shooting. I got the name of one. Stafford cursed. I'm wanting to know who it was, he demanded. I'll make him what damn him, I'll You're carrying on awful, observed Ferguson dryly. But you ain't doing any good. He leaned closer to Stafford. I'm quitting my job right now, he said. Stafford leaned back in his chair, surprised into silence. For an instant he glared at the stray man, and then his lips curled scornfully. "'So you're quitting,' he sneered. "'Scared plum out, cause you seen a man put out of business. "'I reckon Leviatt wasn't far wrong when he said—' "'I wouldn't say a lot,' interrupted Ferguson coldly. "'I ain't admitting that I'm any scared, "'and I ain't carin' a heap, cause Leviatt's been gassin' to you. "'But I'm quitting a job you give me. "'And Radford ain't the man who's been rustlin' your cattle. "'It's someone else.' I'm asking you to hire me to find out whoever it is. I'm wanting a free hand. I don't want anyone asking me any questions. I don't want anyone ordering me around. But if you want the men who are rustling your cattle, I'm offering to do the job. Do I get it? You're keeping right on, working for the two diamond, returned Stafford. Well, I'd like to get a hold of the man who got rope. Ferguson smiled grimly. "'That man'll be getting his some day,' he declared, rising. "'I'm keeping him for myself. Maybe I won't shoot him. I reckon Rope would be some tickled if he knew that the man who shot him could get a chance to think it over while some man was stringing him up. You ain't saying anything about anything.' He turned and went out. Five minutes later, Stafford saw him riding slowly toward the river. 
As the days went, a mysterious word began to be spoken wherever men congregated. No man knew whence the word had come, but it was whispered that Rope Jones would be seen no more. His pony joined the Ramuda. His saddle and other personal effects became prizes for which the men of the outfit cast lots. Inquiries were made concerning the puncher by friends who persisted in being inquisitive, but nothing resulted. In time, the word rustler became associated with his name, and caught with the goods grew to be a phrase that told eloquently of the manner of his death. Later it was whispered that Leviatt and Tucson had come upon Rope behind the ridge, catching him in the act of running off a two-diamond calf. But, as no report had been made to Stafford by either Leviatt or Tucson, the news remained merely rumor. Ferguson had said nothing more to any man concerning the incident. To do so would have warned Tucson, and neither Ferguson nor Miss Radford could have sworn to the man's guilt. In addition to this, there lingered in Ferguson's mind a desire to play this game in his own way. Telling the men of the outfit what he had seen would make his knowledge common property, and in the absence of proof might cause him to appear ridiculous. But, since the shooting, he had little doubt that Leviatt had been Tucson's companion on that day. Rope's scathing words, spoken while Miss Radford had been trying to revive him, You're a hell of a range, boss, had convinced the stray man that Leviatt had been one of the assailants. He had wondered much over the emotions of the two when they returned to the spot where the murder had been committed to find their victim buried and his horse gone. But of one thing he was certain, their surprise over the discovery that the body of their victim had been buried could not have equaled their discomfort on learning that the latter's pony had been secretly brought to the home ranch. And among the men of the outfit was one, at least, who knew something of their guilty secret. Ferguson thought this to be the reason that they had not reported the incident to Stafford. There was now nothing for the stray man to do but watch. The men who had killed Rope were wary and dangerous, and their next move might be directed at him, but he was not disturbed. One thought brought him a mighty satisfaction. He was no longer employed to fasten upon Ben Radford the stigma of guilt. No longer need he feel oppressed with the guilty consciousness, when, in the presence of Mary Radford, that he was, in a measure, a hired spy, whose business it was to convict her brother of the crime of rustling. He might now meet the young woman face to face without experiencing the sensation of guilt that had always affected him. Beneath his satisfaction lurked a deeper emotion. During the course of his acquaintance with Rope Jones, he had developed a sincere affection for the man. The grief in his heart over Rope's death was made more poignant because of the latter's words, just before the final moment, which seemed to have been a plea for vengeance. Ferguson told me to look out. He told me to be careful that they didn't get me between them. But I wasn't thinking it would happen just that way. This had been all that Rope had said about his friend, but it showed that during his last conscious moments he had been thinking of the stray man. As the days passed, the words dwelt continually in Ferguson's mind. Each day that he rode abroad, searching for evidence against the murderers, brought him a day nearer to the vengeance upon which he had determined. End of chapter 15